transhumanism has taken on many different sort of iterations. I mean, there are some, some aspects that I think are across the board. But how does your brand of transhumanism or the one that you most uh, uh, um, click with, how does that differ or how is it similar to perhaps FM 2030's sort of brand of transhumanism? So my journey with transhumanism has been one of attraction and one of repulsion. Um, so um, basically in the beginning when I started, I thought that transhumanism is that kind of a narrative or overarching story that has the potential to bring humanity together on a global scale. And after sort of talking to, you know, hundreds upon hundreds of transhumanists on and off the record, uh, and meeting them in person, etc. I've concluded that at least in its current form and its current version, it absolutely is not. Uh, not only that, but I've personally have stopped using the term transhumanist as far as I'm concerned personally. Um, and uh, even though that has disappointed a lot of my fans because, you know, I have I had a popular uh, article that I wrote 10 years ago, maybe called the Transhumanist Manifesto and, you know, which is sort of like a very sort of declaratory sort of like we would defeat death and all that stuff, kind of simplistic um, uh, so uh, I I think I prefer to what 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 you would call transhuman I prefer to call human, and and I think that transhumanism is basically humanism it, it or it should be anyway, uh, and and so I don't even want to differentiate, but it comes with a certain baggage which is very dangerous. And it's not only dangerous for us, but it's dangerous for the whole world. And what I mean by that is this. So uh, in transhumanism, we have this idea that, that uh, and, and generally that's, that's not a necessarily, again, transhuman idea. That's idea coming from humanism and coming from the enlightenment and the, the renaissance and so on. And you, we can sort of trace the genealogy of that idea. And that's the primacy of men or of primacy of humanity. Uh, so, you know, uh, it used to be the case that historically speaking uh, at, in the hunter-gatherer society, we considered ourselves not to be different from the world around us. We considered ourselves to be a part of the world, not a part of the world. Um, and our religion was, uh, you know, sort of pantheistic. We had uh, uh, lots of gods. Uh, and, and animalistic, so animals could have, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, anthropomorphic or, or human features and, and souls and, and the stones and rivers and trees and the sky and this and the, that. And each one of us was kind of at a sort of a democratic level, decentralized, right? But then we moved from there to the theistic and especially monotheistic step of our development where, you know, there was a single God on the throne and um, we were his creation, his children, especially men, not humanity, but men. Uh, and we were therefore better than the rest of it. And, and the rest of it became simply our garden. So, in other words, for us, for our taking, to do with it as we please to do. Um, and and uh, that created this kind of a hierarchy. So God at the top, we a step below God as the, as the sort of like his greatest creation and the rest of the world created for us, for our own convenience, for our own everything, food, you name it, shelter, water, etc. And then... Uh, with the uh, explosion of the Renaissance, the Enlightenment and humanism, we simply killed God, we had a coup d'etat, and we installed ourselves on that sort of throne. And then we denigrated the animals even further by sort of uh, uh, 
perceiving them now as a mere automatons or automata, as, as Descartes uh, called them at the time, that not only had no soul, but couldn't experience pain, uh, co uh, had no uh, consciousness, uh, and, and in other words, we could kill them and do whatever we want with them as we please, because we are humans and they are not. And men, or first of all, and then eventually humanity, but at the beginning it was men, was the center of the universe, the epitome of uh, uh, the enlightenment, the measure of all things, um, the, the peak of evolution from an evolutionary uh, point of view, which is again not the real Darwin uh, idea, but kind of a misperceived evolutionary point of view. We became uh, to perceive ourselves as the peak of evolution. A and that basically gave us a blank check to do whatever the heck we wanted to do with the rest of our planet, whether with the animals, with the plants, with the air, with the biosphere, you name it. Uh, and then, not only that, but then we went one step further to say that, oh, uh, as, uh, you know, uh, Ray Kurzweil says, there's no evidence of any other intelligent life in the universe. It's very possible that we're the only intelligence. You know, there's this debate between Peter Diamandis and Ray Kurzweil. Peter says that life in the universe is probably everywhere, and we're not unique in that sense, intelligent life we're talking about. And Ray Kurzweil thinks that we are probably very likely the only intelligent life and therefore we are not only the center of this pyramid on our planet but in the whole of the universe humanity is this most special most uh, amazing <laughs> epitome of anything that anything anything that's ever existed and uh, that's kind of a very teleological very religious uh, kind of understanding you know, you simply take one God, call him, you know, Yahweh, call him uh, Christ, call him Muhammad, call him Buddha, call him whoever you want him, and then you replace him with man or humanity. Uh, and, and of course, you have immortality, which is what transhumanism pro uh, promises. And you have this kind of a teleological narrative. Uh, and Ray, Ray Kurzweil uh, is a, a perfect example of that with his six epochs of the singularity, you know starting with uh, information uh, being processed at the level originally at chemistry and physics, uh, then going to biology, then going to uh, brains, uh, humanity's brains, ne the neocortex, then going to technology, that's the fourth stage of the singularity, then the fifth stage is the merger uh, of uh, machines and, and humanity, transhumanity, and then the final stage is when the universe wakes up and we have giant computroniums, endless matryoshka brains, and smart dust everywhere. And, you know, that's a very nice, tight, perfect narrative, uh, you know, but it's not necessarily true. It's just convenient. And the universe is not here for us to, to have a convenient narrative, especially if you're cherry-picking your data points, like Ray is doing. But... Uh, you know, it is. it has enormous appeal, just as much, especially when you're promising people immortality and omnipotence, ev ever presence, you know, all the amazing things that the other religions are promising. Uh, and so uh, I thought that originally this kind of transhuman narrative will be the, a good narrative for us to unite around. Um, uh, and, and then I discovered a number of problems and issues, in my view, with this kind of narrative. Uh, and, and first I started sort of divorcing myself step by step from it slowly. Uh, and secondly, uh, I've gotten to the conclusion that first, I don't think it's likely to unite humanity. And second, um, even if it does, it may come at a very high price in the sense that it's a very useful tool to justify anything that we want to do. Uh, and be, give us a blank check to exterminate any other living organism, not only on our planet, but across the universe. And I see that often in transhumanists. Uh, so, for example, I, I meet people who, when we start talking about the environment and this species just got extinct and that species just got extinct, one of the most annoying answers that I get is, oh, don't worry about it, we'll just bring them back. You know, it's okay, we'll just bring them back as the way we're going to bring the woolly mammoth. You know, 
that, that there's two two problems with that first it uh, betrays profound ignorance about what a woolly mammoth is or any other species because it's not just a biological construct just like we humans are not just a biological construct yes we are biological but that's not all we are and the same way a woolly mammoth is not not just the DNA of the woolly mammoth it's a whole social structure and we know the elephants have a very complicated socially stratified societies with a matriarch with memories they mourn their dead um, and you know there are certain kinds of rituals and certain kinds of learnings and teachings and once you kill all the woolly mammoths even if you uh, 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 clone a brand new woolly mammoth they would never actually be a woolly mammoth they'll be just a new clone which has the same biology but it never had the same training the same environment the same mental or social uh, capacities or experiences uh, or abilities just like you know those orangutans that they they have in captivity now in Indonesia and there's people trying to teach them to go climb on trees because they were orphaned uh, orangutans that uh, had to be adopted to survive they were fed by humans they never learned to fend for their own and that happens with many other species that are very smart like dolphins orca whales you name it and they don't even know how to climb the trees so yeah you can save them biologically and that's good it's better than killing them obviously but they're never going to be the orangutan that you know to be an orangutan in a forest jumping from a tree and, and tree and being free and doing what orangutans do because if an orangutan can't even climb a tree what kind of orangutan are we talking about here right and so that's part first part of the ignorance but second part is like even if we can bring them back it's like still that kind of hubris that kind of arrogance is like it is up to us to decide who lives and who dies at the species level we're not talking about I'm gonna kill you to eat today we're talking about we're gonna kill you all and we feel okay because we can bring you back these divergences I mean I think what you're saying and again you, you um, is that the, the main flaw for your transhumanism is as it's as we've gotten to this place it has at its tip um the supremacy of man and not just the supremacy of man but it's almost given agency to that supremacy i mean i i think that's what you're saying it's not just that we put ourselves at the top of the pyramid we're saying we now have to utilize all the powers at, in terms of being at the top and that to you feels um well not what doesn't fulfill the promises what so i guess the question for you is what would have been or in terms of your human the whatever you've replaced this with what are the promises of whatever the philosophy is that's going to create a more a fairer more holistic world and, and when i say world i don't just mean on this planet specifically so so uh, th that's another thing with transhumanism it is hard for transhumanism the idea however you comprehend or or understand that and there's a big divergence of, of that sort of term but it's hard for it to inform and guide you in their in your daily life isn't it if look it depends how rigorous the philosophy is and how nuanced it is i mean if if the basic philosophy is you know, tools are going to solve everything. Technology and science is, is going to solve everything. I think in a way it's very limiting because you're just like, I'm going to go to sleep. I'm actually going to go into cryogenics for the next 50 years and wait for everything to, to figure itself out. If it is as simplistic as that, that doesn't seem like a way to, to do anything. But I think there are nuances. Like we have the ability technologically, scientifically to do all sorts of things. That doesn't necessarily mean we should do all of those things. Because if there's anything... Feed and clothe and shelter and provide clean water to every human being on our planet. And yet we have something like 800 million people who are starving. We have two, two and a half billion people without access to clean water. It's not even so much the exploiting of the planet. I don't like the word. But it's also this, there is a selfishness or a, um, an ego that 
is detrimental. It, it allows us to, to still have infant mortality and, and various other things that we really, as you say, we should have gotten rid of. And so the question is... That's part of our narrative, right? Because you say you don't like the, the word uh, exploiting the, the, the environment. But once you have human at the center of the universe, and once you have us as the measure of everything, then it's 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 right there in the narrative then you know nature we we stop being a, a part of nature but we become a part of her and she's feminine and we're masculine and then we have this kind of uh freudian uh, post freudian oedipus complex of conquering nature of like subduing us which is basically a kind of a masculine rape uh, dream of some sort uh you know and and, and and which we are kind of doing right and all that comes from stems from that narrative which uh, puts us way above nature right a and separates us and transhumanism separates us even further and makes us even more special because we're not only going to tr transcend humanity because the reason right now we're human is because we're connected to nature but we're going to be transhuman when we transcend nature when we transcend biology and that's even more separating us and therefore allowing us to do even more damage to her while not realizing that damaging her is damaging us but it's okay yeah. because we're transhuman you know one of the most in interesting people that i, I met uh, not only because he's interesting and he, he was intellectually really a really smart person he was a really de lovely decent person is ken hayworth and i mean he I think he would probably describe himself as a transhumanist, but I think it's less about supremacy and more about the oneness, the, what it means to be a part of this thing, not just in terms of the planet, but also our fellow human beings. Now, there's something that's a little earthy crunchy about that concept. The most popular idea of transhumanism stemming both from Zoltan and from Ray is a very individualistic one, which we shouldn't forget, right? And with Zoltan is even more to, to, to the Ayn Randian end uh, than Ray, because with Zoltan it's even more like, you know, we are our own people, we are islands, you know, we are, there's no society but, you know, a bunch of individuals doing their own best interest. You know, uh, and so if there's no society, forget about nature then. You know, if you cut out that unit completely out of everything else, then the unit either is not responsible or shouldn't care about anything else. It, other than its own rational self-interest, of course. You know, it's funny because I, I am thinking about FM as you're talking about. We've got these two pers personalities, very interesting personalities, Zoltan and Ray. And here was FM talking about these idea of catalysts and he would have included you as a catalyst that we have to have these conversations and whether you know the term doesn't quite fit we reshape the term i mean look humanity as much as here we are conversating and i, I you know, and and exchanging ideas and that's wonderful there's there's also a, a, there's also historically been a terrible violence attached to 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 this and Again, if we look at certain metrics, and I'm not a metrics person, but metrics are important, we have seen some improvements. I mean, even in, even in regards to, as we became aware of what we were doing in the environmentalism, there has been a whole you know, a growth in the environmental movement and in people being caretakers for our planet, or at least being concerned for our planet. Is it where it should be? Probably not, well, 100% not, but I guess, you know, these, these, the idea that we are going to have a better future is one that is appealing. Does that mean a better future at the expense of... But is that blood? a transhumanist idea or is that a, a, an idea a, a related to progress? Because when Francis Bacon invented the idea of progress, right, that there was no transhumanism you know before francis bacon there was no idea there was no concept of progress the idea was that the world is and will always remain to be and children lived basically like their grand grand grandfathers 
used to live in the usually in the same place usually doing the same jobs and making a living in the same exact way the, the idea of progress never existed and it was Francis Bacon for the first time in the 1500s who came up with the idea from his Christian zeal by the way he invented the term progress first of all 100 150 years before the Industrial Revolution and uh, considered it to be the highest charity of a good Christian because uh, and especially to become a good scientist because a good scientist could impact positively the future generations and that was the nicest thing that a good Christian could ever do right but th that idea is not a transhuman idea well I guess what make what for me makes it transhuman in, in light of how we frame it today is that progress is measured on our efficiency and our, and, and our, I mean, this is what people say. Again, I'm not, I don't like to term myself a transhumanist. I don't like to term myself with any particular labels, except that I care about my fellow human being. I, I want uh, my, my children's life on this planet to be as free of, of, um, hardship and, and pain and, and so on. And I'd like it to be a friendlier, nicer world. <laughs> that's what I'd like. And whether that's transhumanism, humanism, singularity 2.3 or 4.8, it doesn't matter to me. These are, some of this is semantics. Now, language is important. How we express ideas are, is important. So for the question, the, que the transhumanist will say that this progress that we are making is because of science and technology. To me, the danger of that is it's not just the science and the technology. There are other aspects too. And so Francis Bacon may have created progress. We're now seeing progress as a, res uh, as a result of some of these technological advances sort of labeled in this way that this is going to be the savior, not of the world and everything that lives in it, but the human being. And this, I, I think this is a problem as you've described as you've described it. But here's the crux of the matter, and maybe we're coming here to the, to the most important point, the bottom line. Uh, so the, let me start by saying, so transhumanists often identify science and technology with transhumanism. That's, a, that, that's not the case. You can have, and you did have science and transhumanism, uh, science and technology without transhumanism. Okay, so we shouldn't conflate them. But the important stuff is this. And, and you kind of went for that sort of pitfall right now, you demonstrated it, that it was the science and technology who did all this progress. No, it was not the science and technology. It was us. It was humanity choosing to take one course of action in favor, one kind of outcome over another kind of outcome. And science and technology were merely the enabler or the tool, but not the agent and not the primary primary mover and not the cause of these things happen which is why of course today we have the science and the technology to accomplish many things as I mentioned shelter food for every living clean water for every living being on our planet but we're not doing it not because of lack of science and technology but because we lack commitment and because of other reasons non-technological and non-scientific and that's the crux of the matter what does transhumanism have to offer to us to, for our future is what I ask myself one day. And my conclusion is that stoicism and basic ethics has a lot more to offer than transhumanism. Why? Because technology and science are merely a means to an end, a tool, a how to do things. That's what transhumanism is, because especially if it goes for the fall and identifies itself with science and transhumanism. It's merely a tool, it's how we do things. But the more important issue is why we want to do certain things and what do we want to do, how we organize our priorities. And only then do we go for the particular science and the particular technology that can build or destroy one vision over another vision. And those are choices that are ethical choices. They don't stem from science and they don't stem from technology. They stem from ethics. They stem from values. They stem uh, from our integrity. They stem from our compassion. They, they stem from many other things for which transhumanism in general 
uh, has had very little to say. And I have to give some credit here to FM2030 because he's been criticized that he's been non-scientific uh, by many of the later uh, transhumanists. Yes, he may be less scientific than them, but he is a better visionary with more compassion, with more humanity, with the heart of a poet, with the, with the, the, the soul of an artist. And I well, value that more. And again, because those are the things that inspire the science. Those are the things that motivate us to build a dream, to make it a reality, to destroy another dream, to get up and fight against an injustice. Not the science and the technology, but those things. And that's why I've personally gravitated back to the essence of what it means to be human. Because that's the essence which is going to uh, help us steer towards our future, one version of it or another, and which eventually will be responsible to whether we destroy ourselves or we populate the universe as Ray Kurzweil or conquer the universe as like a hyper-masculine, you know, wet dream come true. Uh, you know, uh, so whether we make it or break it would not depend on the science and on the technology, but how it is applied on our values, on our integrity, on our compassion, and about our narrative, who we are, who we are, where we're coming from, and where we're going. And I personally found that transhumanism didn't give me satisfactory answers to those things.